Okay, I still see that people are still joining, but um, we're going to get down to business and introduce the webinar. So please let us know um, if you can hear me. Um, oh, hey, Vince. Nice to meet you. Um, so that chat is where you can say hello and also ask any questions that you may have. So today we are presenting a very special webinar uh, just for our oh, friends in Ohio. Um, and so uh, welcome to Chimura's impact of COVID-19 on Ohio's economy. Uh, if you've watched with us before, welcome back. Uh, we've been hosting these webinars since uh, COVID began, but in case it's your first time, maybe you got this invite from a friend or from the Greater Cleveland Partnership and you're kind of wondering what is Chimura and why are we talking about economic forecasts? Chimura provides labor market data and analysis so that you can make informed decisions that help your organizations grow. We help economic developers, site selectors, educators, and workforce professionals. We were founded in 1998 um, by Dr. Chris Chimura, who is one of our speakers today. Um, and now we have offices in Richmond, Cleveland, uh, and Dallas. Oh, and I see, hi, Mark and Joseph in the chat. So we are economists, we're data scientists, statisticians, and business professionals who really care about helping your community grow. And how we do that is through our JobsEQ software tools, which are the best labor market analysis tools on the market. Um, and in fact, we've recently released four new JobsEQ products. We've got JobsEQ Pro, which takes you, gives, provides data down to the census block level, which is perfect for municipalities who need to analyze data by, you know, city wards or, um, you know, get really in depth on what does employment look like in a specific neighborhood. Um, we've also got JobsEQ for education, JobsEQ for workforce, and JobsEQ for economic development. And I know a lot of the folk on this call are, you know, economic and community developers. Um, but if you don't have the time or resources to analyze your own labor market or get your hands in the data, um, or if you need help creating a strategic plan, Chimura has consultants who can perform that analysis for you. And both on our software consulting and data sides, we are driven by client satisfaction and success. And excellence is our first priority, both in customer service and in, in data quality. Um, and so we've got our software, we've got our consulting, but fundamentally at Chimura, we believe everyone deserves access to high quality economic analysis. And that's why we offer a lot of resources for free. What you're seeing here is our weekly economic update, which is a great national overview of the economy written by our economists, including Chris, who's on this call. And it's just a great overview that is set to your inbox every weekend. So if you don't want to check the news uh, on a weekend, uh, we'll come to you. We'll just show up right there in your inbox. Um, we also have a blog um, that talks a lot about you know how people use data to make good decisions. We've got a podcast, and you can find that on our website. So if you're interested in receiving this weekly economic update, it's totally free. You can click on the link that I just sent in the chat and sign yourself up. We would love to have you and forward it to, to you know, anyone who would be interested in it. Um, I know my grandfather gets it and loves to hear <laughs> updates from Chris every weekend. So a few logistics things before I introduce our speakers. Please type your questions in the chat. Um, and we, I will send them to Chris and, and Scott, and um, they will answer them by the end of the webinar. Everyone who registered for this webinar will get a recording and a copy of the PowerPoint deck. Um, and you're going to want that because we've got a lot of good data for you that's really specific to the Ohio economy. So let's introduce our speakers. First, we've got Chris Chimura. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Chimura Economics, um, which she founded in 1998. Uh, before that, she was the chief economist at Crestar Bank, which is now SunTrust. Um, 
She is a blue chip economic forecaster, one of only like a few dozen in the United States, and is a national thought leader on labor economics. Um, and you know, has 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 built this company that provides software and consulting that makes it easy to understand your local economy. And today, uh, she is joined by Scott Harrington from the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Many of you may know him. He is the Senior Manager of Business Growth and Development for the Greater Cleveland Partnership. In addition to business outreach, Scott's responsibilities include internal data and metrics, project management, tracking partner referrals and media relations for the partnership's business growth and development team. And so before Chris um, launches into our forecasts, we're going to hear from Scott, uh, because recently the Greater Cleveland Partnership has subscribed to our JobsEQ software tool. And uh, we just wanted to check in and see see how it's going. So Scott, tell us. Um, yeah, tell us how you guys are using it. Sure, thanks, Avery. Um, and Avery shared the registration list with me earlier and was very excited to see so many of our members and municipal partners uh, are taking part today. Most of you probably know about GCP, but for those of you who might not, um, GCP is a regional chamber of commerce, 13,000 members roughly of all sizes. And when we say all sizes, that's you know, from one or two person shops that are cozy members up to Eaton and Sherwin Williams. So it truly is uh, all sizes. Um, we have the typical activities that you would associate with a, a chamber, uh, physical development, workforce development, advocacy, diversity and inclusion. We have a great uh, network uh, or events team that puts on networking events, which of course had to do remotely all last year, but Looking forward to getting some of those back in person uh, in the near future. Um, and then the economic development part of it, um, I think for most chambers of commerce, we have a pretty robust, uh, we call it the business growth and development uh, team. And I would direct you to gcpingear.com for some more in-depth uh, information on our service offerings. But uh, essentially, what our team does is connect growing businesses with the readily readily available resources in the Northeast Ohio economic development ecosystem. We went out and met with about 1,200 companies last year, um, trying to uncover growth opportunities. Um, you know, and at the end of the meeting, you know, maybe it's just a referral to a partner, or sometimes you know we run, uncover some projects that come out of that. Um, but we started accessing the Jobs EQ platform in January uh, to support our efforts. Uh, so we're only a couple a couple months into it, um, but we've really started to realize the potential and started leveraging uh, the tool. Um, so I wanted to uh, just pick three items out of the toolbox. Uh, this certainly isn't an exhaustive list, but I know that there's a lot of economic development folks out there. So I just wanted to give three examples of information that's available through this platform and how we how we leverage it to, to do a better job of what, with what we do. Um, first that came to mind were the industry snapshots. So you can pick manufacturing, IT, aerospace, uh, and then it'll give you workforce availability, availability data, um, GDP and productivity, so information on the supply chain that's uh, available within a defined region. So we have an eight county footprint, so we've kind of uh, reserved that as one of the uh, regions that we're able to access easily as a municipality. Maybe you would do your city and the surrounding cities or, or what have you. Um, but we've been able to use this. Um, first of all, when we go out to talk with a company, it's a good uh, thing to review before we go out and do that. For example, uh, you know, I don't know anything about aerospace if i'm going out to meet with an aerospace company i can look at that report and you know have have a more intelligent conversation ask some good questions and maybe share some information with them that they would find interesting um, it's also valuable when we're doing attraction work i actually just spoke with vince who got a shout out at the beginning of the podcast by the way about 45 minutes ago before we came on here um, we were discussing a meeting we have tomorrow where we're trying to attract a company here. They're looking at a different market in the Midwest or Cleveland. 
and we're going to be able to supply them with not only some specific data points that they asked for that we're going to be able to provide, but also uh, maybe this uh, overview of the industry strength in this specific region that they will find helpful. So anything we can do to give the client more data points to help them make their decision. Um, the second is uh, workforce and wage data. Um, you can find uh, the availability based on either specific occupation codes or even by soft skills to just look at a specific area and see how many people there are, uh, you know, potential employees in a, uh, in a specific area uh, to help a company make decisions on whether that's the right place for them. Um, we're able to supply them with information on, for example, percentile wages. Maybe they're saying they need some help with workforce because they're having trouble keeping people. And the data says that, well, you're you're in the 22nd percentile for, for wages. So maybe that's something you want to revisit. Also, uh, we do some site selection work. And let's say we have a, a company that's looking to add a, a logistics and distribution center and they've got one site. We give them two sites, one in County A and the other on the other side of town in County B. We can give them some, in addition to the information on, you know, finding a finding a building that works for them, we can give them some data on the, the workforce availability in that surrounding area to help them make that decision. So maybe option A, the building looks a little bit better. Prices, it's maybe a better fit. Doesn't The building doesn't need as much work, but looking for the job, the specific jobs they're going to need uh, to fill that and get that operation up and running, they might have trouble there. Whereas site B, Maybe the building needs a little bit more work, but we can show them that they'll have a better, uh, an easier time uh, filling those jobs. So again, the more information we can give the people making the decisions, the better. And then the, the third one I would point out where these are pretty cool, the economic impact and what if tools, um, they're event based. So you can say, all right, let's say uh, an automotive manufacturer were to open up in this and add 200 employees in this specific area, it would be able to show, uh, for example, the supply chain uh, with all the different elements of their supply chain that they're going to need and have location quotients and how how robust, how much of their pipeline uh, and their supply chain are they going to be able to fill locally and how much will they have to uh, outsource outside the region. Um, and then uh, it can also show the ripple effects of uh, adding those adding those jobs. Um, maybe it's a 200 person manufacturing operation, but there's uh, ancillary hiring that's going to come out of that event. Um, an example that I would give would be uh, the rocket mortgage expansion. Um, we, we didn't start using this tool until after we were done uh, helping with that, but yes, there's 630 jobs that are added and about 50 million in associated payroll, but Jobs EQ tool told us that, you know, there's really an additional two or 300 jobs that are going to come out of that when you consider, um, you know, the restaurants around where those people are going to be working. They're all going to, you know, buy a car, rent an apartment, go to Home Depot, whatever. Um, it's able to really give you a, a more holistic picture of what the impact of those events are going to be. And that helps us as we as we pitch, let's say we're pitching a project for Jobs Ohio incentives. Now, obviously the Rocket Mortgage, mortgage that's a big one, that was easy. Um, but let's say it's a smaller one that isn't a layup for some type of incentives. You can show, yes, they're hiring 50 people with a million dollars or you know 1.5 million in, in payroll, but really there's this added economic impact um, that's also going to be a part of this. And, and that can help you make that argument or justify uh, incentives being deployed in that situation. So, um, I knew there were a lot of economic development professionals listening, so I just wanted to throw out a few examples. As I said, these are not all the tools in the toolbox, but just a few examples that I wanted to share. And uh, we can't say enough about our experience uh, so far on the JobsEQ platform. And with that, I will turn it over to 
Dr. Chris Chimer. Thanks, Scott. It's always good to hear about how um, people are using Jobs EQ to further their community, and it. Um, uh, so I'm I'm glad that um, it's having an impact in the uh, greater Cleveland area, which, by the way, um, is where I grew up. Um, so I am glad to be on this uh, webinar to provide some information on how um, Ohio is doing through the COVID-19. So first, we're going to begin with a national economic update. Um, encouraging economic trends that we're seeing. We're seeing progress toward herd, herd immunity. We have a uh, model on that that I'll share with you and give you a sense of where Ohio is in that herd immunity. Um, in terms of the impact on Ohio, we'll look at industries and occupations, the skills that have been needed over this past year, and uh, look at a comparison to the national recovery. So with that, first beginning with the national economy, um, Across the globe, a uh, recession is defined as two consecutive drops in gross domestic product, GDP. Uh, that comes out quarterly, but here in the US, we have a group called the National Bureau of Economic Research that defines recession dates by looking at monthly data. When they look at um, several indicators, here are three of them on this slide. Uh, it, gray shaded areas are recessions. Here is employment. And notice that when we went into the lockdown, into the COVID recession, we basically lost all the jobs created over the past expansion. Um, and, and pay attention to this because when we look at Ohio, you're gonna see something different. In terms of the rebound, we're back more than 50% of all jobs in the prior two recessions, they were called a jobless recovery. And it took more than two years to get back 50% of the jobs. It slowed a bit. But the latest data for March shows, again, almost a 1 million increase during that month. And we would expect that to continue as we see more people that have been vaccinated and getting out and feeling safe to go and spend. On the right-hand side now is personal income and consumption. So basically spending by consumers. And this is important because they make up about 70% of GDP, gross domestic product. Here you're looking at the percent change from a year ago. When we were, went into lockdown, of course, people weren't spending. Uh, uh, consumer spending on goods and services was off by 15% compared to the previous year. And it came back a lot quicker than many economists expected. Now we're down only about uh, 2 to 3% from a year ago, which is, is very good considering um, the COVID um, uh, situation. So income, though, jumped because the federal government was very quick to provide stimulus, um, increase in unemployment insurance, as well as um, uh, payments to households. And so you saw that um, income increase um, fell back down to around 4% more normal, normal popped up uh, in December because of the, again, the um, stimulus that was passed before the end of the year coming back down. But we would expect to see that uh, increasing again with um, additional stimulus packages. Uh, industrial production, so output of um, output of manufacturing, um, oil and gas, and utilities. Again, plunged when we went into the recession, and this is an index. Um, so you can see that uh, we dropped from about 110 down to nearly 90, so a decrease of 20 percentage points. Uh, we've rebounded quite well. It fell off. Um, earlier uh, this year because of some of the snow in the southern part of the U.S. and some supply chain constraints, and now it's back on the increase. So um, the broadest indicator of economic activity, GDP, you can see when we went into this recession, down 5%, that's annualized, first quarter of last year, second quarter, down 30% annualized, but then the rebound in the, fourth, in the third quarter was up nearly the same amount and then we saw about 5% growth in the fourth quarter of last year. Um, you can see that compared to the Great Recession, which was the worst recession since the Depression, um, this one was deeper, but it was also shorter um, and not sustained. Here, in terms of the first quarter of GDP coming out soon, we expect it to be um, nearly 5%. Some economists are looking at um, 6% because of all the consumer spending that we've seen. And as we go out, Notice up around 5% over the next year or so, and then down to around 4%. So coming out of this recession, 
We expect the second half of this year to be very strong in terms of GDP. And even into 2022, very strong. And maybe some of that trickling over into 2023 because of the rebound. People have not been spending all the stimulus money that they've gotten. And so as they feel safe and go out and start spending, we're going to see strong growth. And as a baseline, anytime you see anything above 2%, it's considered very strong growth. So um, herd immunity, it's going to take until we get to herd immunity before people get out and start to spend more and the economy gets back to more normal. So um, here to give you a sense of the cases in the U.S. So we saw an increase after Thanksgiving, after Christmas holidays. Uh, it spiked and it has been coming down. It inched up a bit um, after the spring break and has been trending down a uh, good sign. And of course, we're economists, we're not medical scientists. And so we are relying on the University of Washington forecast for infections to drive our model in terms of, of herd immunity. Um, and it's interesting because we economists right now are relying on health statistics more than anything to drive our forecast, economic forecast, which we've never done in the past. Typically, we're, our forecast assumption, assumptions are things like how fast will the Fed increase interest rates or decrease them? How much is the price of um, oil going up? Um, or how low will the unemployment rate get um, and cause an increase in wages and then in prices overall? So here, again, the main driver of our model that we continue to update on at least a weekly basis is uh, the number of infections, and I'll give you some of the other drivers as well. And um, we were talking before this uh, webinar that we've been doing this model, presenting this model since February, and just about every week that we would update the model, the numbers would get better. That is, we've got a most likely forecast, and I'll give you some of the assumptions there, um, um, and we assume herd immunity occurs at 80%, that's where this dotted line is, um, and here you see the optimistic forecast and then the pessimistic. This is the first week since we've been doing this model that actually the numbers have slipped. That is, we're not looking to get to herd immunity as fast as we're, we had expected the prior week um, because of a reduction in the number of people that are getting the vaccine. So here, um, the expectation between the optimistic and most likely is that we get to herd immunity by late summer, early fall. And in the pessimistic case, we don't see it um, until later um, in the fall, say October time range or even November. And again, uh, we assume that at this point, people will be more people will be back working at the offices, spending money at restaurants um, and other places. Uh, some of our assumptions are here. And if you'd like to read our assumptions in more detail, uh, you can go to our blog. If you put in herd immunity, um, Chimura and um, in fact, Avery's just put it uh, in the chat, so you can click on that. We have the assumptions back from February, by, but by the end of this week, we expect to have these assumptions updated um, with data through um, uh, today. And also, um, we'll be doing some more research on um, whether people are not getting vaccinated, vaccinated as much as we were expecting here, and we'll bring that into the model, so be on the lookout for that. But some of the assumptions... 600 million total vaccines purchased from Moderna and Pfizer, 200 million from Johnson & Johnson, and that's the single dose as of April 27th. Over 141 million Americans, or 43%, received a single dose, and 97 million are fully vaccinated. That's based on the um, CDC. Um, on average, over the past week, we're administering 2.7 million doses per day, Unfortunately, that's a decrease of 10% from the prior week. We had gotten all the way up to 3 million a day. And just to put that into perspective, at the beginning of this year, we were seeing 1 million per day. And many medical experts say said that there was no way that we'd ever get to 3 million. But we, we clearly did. And we were at that pace for several weeks. Um, some other broad as assumptions here, 80% is the threshold for herd immunity. And... Um, we assume that 80% of Americans will be willing to get the vaccine. Uh, Pfizer, Kaiser has been doing a survey, February is the last one released, but we should be seeing March soon, where they were saying 79% of Americans were willing to get the vaccine. 
and that pace had been increasing. Again, we're doing some additional research because now we're seeing in some areas that uh, people are not getting vaccinated as much. We also assume that these vaccines maintain high level of efficacy against the new and existing variants. So with that, how do we look around the nation? Um, New Mexico, so the green areas um, are moving toward herd immunity faster. The brighter greens, the fastest, here's New Mexico. And the darker blues are moving at a slower rate. So you can see you're sort of in the middle here um, in Ohio. In terms of our most likely scenario, um, the green states um, are looking for herd immunity in July, uh, the lighter green in August, the gray in September, uh, which is where Ohio is, um, the light blue in October, and the dark blue in November. Um, the, we expect New Mexico, if the trends continue to be the first state to her reach herd immunity, and that would be in July, in August, 14 more states get to herd immunity in September, 30 more, and then just five states in October. But where is Ohio in this? Um, if we continue with the current pace, we would expect Ohio to see herd immunity late September or about one week ahead of the U.S. Right now, you're ranking 33 in terms, 33 among the states in terms of the states, the people that have had their first dose and that's nearly 40% of Ohioans have had their first dose compared to 43% in the U.S. However, you're ranked 19th in terms of the number of, or the percentage of people who have had their second dose. So 31% of Ohioans have had their second dose compared to 29% um, in the U.S. overall. So uh, you're doing a good job in Ohio in terms of getting the vaccines. Before we get down to Ohio, there's one question that seems to be large in people's minds, and that is how much of this work from home is going to stick with us uh, after the pandemic? And so the BLS ad added a question to their household survey regarding this, and this is the percentage of people that teleworked in the past four months, four weeks due to the pandemic. So here in July, it was 26%. It continued to drop until we saw in December uh, when we saw an uptick in the um, number of people with the virus. And then it has been coming down and the latest numbers in March show that only 21% of people teleworked in the past four weeks due to the pandemic. And also we've heard a lot about migration trends. Um, you would think that anecdotally, everyone's leaving the inner cities and going out and working um, remotely from different areas around the country um, because there are a lot to. Um, here's a great article that, um, that was in the New York Times just a few days ago that used data from the US Postal Service to identify where people, how many people are moving based on change of address. And the bottom line of the story is that it's mainly in a couple of the large, um, large MSAs such as San Francisco, um, Boston, Washington, D.C., or no, it's not, not Washington, but um, New York City, where we're seeing a trend outward. And a lot of that is going to the suburbs rather than going to different states around the U.S. So, again, just um, you'll get a copy of this um, presentation later. And this is definitely a good um, article to take a look at. Now on to Ohio. Congratulations. Um, in 2020, based on Site Selection Magazine, uh, you were awarded for the second year the most projects per capita. Um, it slipped a bit. In 2020, you had 419 projects or expansions per capita. And in 2019, um, prior to the pandemic, you were at 448. So there you are, um, along with Texas, who won um, for actually the ninth year in a row uh, the most um, the most um, projects overall um, in the country. So congratulations to you in Ohio for maintaining um, that pace. And clearly, um, you and with your governor, um, governor's leadership, um, met 2020 COVID challenges. So Governor DeWine, uh, we heard his daily pandemic updates and you were one of the first states to have closures. And even so during this time, he was active in his chief economic developer role. Um, 
like many other care areas across the U.S., uh, producers and manufacturers expanded the amount of PPP they were um, creating, and some switched and created it for the first time to help out. And then you had some new initiatives. Uh, you had the pilot during the pandemic of Ohio to work, uh, or last year, I should say, um, where um, you created new innovation districts in Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus that were focusing on technology and healthcare and each of the different areas focused on a different type of healthcare um, to try to bring growth again to Ohio. And then um, as part of the executive budget, um, you invested more than $1 billion in Ohio to work and tech cred. So here, trying to strengthen the workforce with technology skills. And um, you've got this great um, YouTube um, um, video here on recruiting IT talent. And, and I didn't um, hear about this from anyone in Ohio, but some people in Richmond um, and Hampton Roads, where we're working with them on trying to attract IT sent this to me as a great uh, example of how other states um, best practices uh, attracting talent to the region. So um, uh, shout out to you, um, Economic Development Ohio, Economic Development for doing a great job. And again, if you haven't seen this, uh, please click on it and look at it when you get um, these slides. So how are we doing relative to the nation? Gray shaded areas are recessions. Um, the uh, dark but the blue shaded is Ohio percent change from a year ago in terms of employment. And you can see that you're tracking just about the same. Right now, you're down 6.6% jobs from a year ago, the latest data being the um, third quarter of 2020. Um, and then um, the U.S. is down 6.8%. If we go back to the last recession, uh, you saw a greater decline than the U.S. in part because of manufacturing is is more sensitive to the business cycle. You came out pretty strong, again, because of manufacturing. And then um, over this expansion period, growing at a slower rate than the US overall. So how does that look in terms of jobs? So now we're going back to 2003 and look at this sharp drop, uh, lost 264,000 jobs so far during the COVID recession. But remember when I showed you the US chart in the US, um, every job that was created over the expansion was lost. So we're not seeing that in Ohio. If you were like the US, your job loss would be down to somewhere a little bit below 5.3 million. So clearly you've, been, you've done better during um, this recession in terms of holding up with the job losses and comparing to the Great Recession, um, you've not seen as many job losses, uh, nearly 440,000 job loss during the Great Recession. Um, again, encouraging here to see that 2020, before uh, we saw COVID have an impact, you were at a point where jobs um, were higher than they were back in the early 2000 period. So again, some encouraging signs that we're seeing here. But when we look at the industry mix overall, um, here are the major sectors. And at the very bottom, the expectation is for a loss of 0.1%. It says a one-year forecast, but that's really a one-year forecast on average for the next 10 years. So a slight decline. My expectation is that this forecast is a little bit too negative for a couple of reasons. We just saw all the um, economic development hits that you've been seeing over the last two years. And also manufacturing is the second largest sector in your region in Ohio. Typically, it's at least halfway down or even down further in terms of its importance. But manufacturing, the expected decline is 0.8 per year. But this forecast was done before COVID, meaning that it was done before some of the supply chain issues came up during COVID. And um, clearly, um, we've seen some manufacturing coming back to the U.S., and that may cause this number to be not as negative or even positive. So how do we do this forecast? Well, it's based on overall national trends, how much is offshoring, uh, demographics. It's also based off of when we go down to the regional level and the state level, uh, the demographics um, and the historical data um, in the region. So again, um, main sectors here, I've rank ordered this based on total employment. And in the second column, we're looking at annual average wages. This is for the third quarter of 2020. 
So the annual average wage in general in Ohio is almost 53,000. Notice that manufacturing pays better than that, nearly 63,000. Some other high paying management of companies and enterprises. So this is where you have headquarters or regional headquarters in the region. Another um, high paying finance and insurance as well as professional scientific and technical services. So overall, a very um, diverse um, mix of uh, industries. And that's in fact, one of the reasons why site selection said uh, that you came up so high in the rankings um, this year. Uh, location quotient, you're all economic developers or many of you are, I know we have some workforce and education per people on the line. So whenever the LQ is greater than one, it means you have a greater percentage of employment in that industry relative to the nation. If it's over 1.25, people say that you really have a strong economic uh, competitive advantage, meaning that it's easier to attract manufacturing firms to the region because you already have the buyer supplier relationships, you already have the training providers, you have the workforce needed. So if we go down again, here you see headquarters at 1.62, you have a lot of regional headquarters. So this would translate into office type um, jobs. Next, um, I'm, I looked at the one year history because I'm trying to get a sense of how well did these uh, sectors do during the COVID. So uh, again, quarter three of 2020 compared to quarter three of, of 2019. And here I've highlighted those that have seen the greatest employment change that has declined in, and also in terms of percentages. So the greatest employment decline was in, in accommodation and food service. No surprise, we've seen that across the US. That's a 13% drop off. Um, also a large drop off in manufacturing, uh, 40,000 jobs or nearly 66% and down toward the bottom again, similar to the US art, entertainment and recreation, lost 20,000 jobs or nearly 19%. So um, some more information here, this one year forecast, again, it's a, it's a one year forecast on average for the next 10 years. And here we're looking at the growth rate and the employment growth, and that's based on how much in demand are these items. So we're gonna need a lot more healthcare and social assistance because of the demographics. So simply because this industry is growing, we're gonna see um, more employees needed, and here the growth rate is 0.7. Um, percent on average per year. Another one that's um, fast growing is professional scientific, scientific and technical services. Again, uh, I'm happy to see that because of its high wage. Um, but when we look at manufacturing, notice a decline, 0.8% translates into 5,000, a little over 5,600 jobs per year. So that makes one think, well, gosh, that's not a good industry to go into. Um, and that's not the way to think about it because we need to also consider how many jobs are open because people are transferring, leaving manufacturing and going to a different industry, or they're exiting mostly because they're retiring. Um, and here you see the number for manufacturing. And then when we add all three of these together, we get total demand on average, needing 64,000 people in manufacturing um, a year in Ohio for the next 10 years to either fill positions where people are exiting or moving to a different industry. And again, it pays very well. So it's it's one that um, if people are transitioning out of different sectors, they should consider as a, a good job to have. Um, healthcare and social assistance, uh, 91,000 on average needed per year in Ohio to see the growth rate as well as people that are leaving the industry um, and going to different industries. So now a little more detail in Ohio on um, uh, em employment losses during COVID. So if you do have jobs EQ, you can go into the forecast and look at an alternative forecast um, with COVID. And so that's, the, uh, here it's called the event-based model. It's the uh, COVID um, forecast. So here you can see the employment decline um, all the way through where we have actual data. Uh, we expect it to, can you decline through the end of last year? So of course, we're now into the first quarter. So you're in this period where you're seeing growth occurring, but when all is said and done and we get the actual data in, it looks like we're estimating that you will have lost nearly 370,000 jobs in Ohio due to the um, uh, recession. Now looking at some of the sectors, again, similar to the nation, a 
big drop off in accommodation and food services. In fact, this 90,000 represents about a quarter of all the jobs that will be lost um, due to um, COVID. You see the um, rebound coming back fairly quickly, but not getting there until 2022. 20, um, uh, manufacturing, uh, again, you see the job loss here, and then it's starting to come back. Um, because of the forecast being negative, you can see the drop off going forward. Again, this is a forecast that, that I'm questioning. And when we get to update that again, I'm expecting that it will be a little more positive than what we're showing here. Um, arts entertainment, a loss of 31,000 jobs. And similarly, it comes back um, fairly quickly, but not until 2022 that we're getting back near previous COVID levels professional scientific and technical services. So these would be jobs like consulting, uh, architects, uh, co some cons um, uh, computer related jobs. Uh, notice the decline is not as steep, 7,500, 7,600 or so jobs lost. And then you see it coming back a bit quicker to get to its previous job loss or previous, um, uh, previous employment levels before COVID began. Uh, transportation and warehousing, 3,300 job loss, but notice that it is um, in this quarter where we are now, um, we're above where we expect to be above levels that we saw um, previous to COVID starting. And of course, this is in part due to the fact that um, people are having things sent, sent home. They're not going to the grocery stores. They're having it delivered or they're um, buying online. They're using Amazon more. And we expect that trend to continue, although not at the level that we're seeing uh, during this recession. So how are you doing in terms of the unemployment rate? And all of the MSAs in, your, um, in Ohio are less than that of the U.S. The U.S. is 6.3% as of February 2021. Uh, Steubenville is at 6.7%, a bit higher. But the two lowest, Cincinnati at 46 and Columbus 4.7%. So overall, the state uh, doing pretty well in terms of the uh, unemployment rates. Um, in terms of the occupations, and I, I did this a little differently than I usually do, and I looked at the top 20 occupations by the six-digit SOC code. So the um, BLS tracks about 820 occupations. And here, to get a sense of what occupations were in demand over the past year, I rank ordered the occupations based on where it's yellow here, the employment change, um, the number of, of uh, jobs needed over, or the number of jobs that um, we saw produced or again needed over the past year. And I've highlighted in blue um, those that are healthcare related. So personal care aides, nurse practitioners, unfortunately health counselors have been in great demand um, during this period. And a lot of that has been telemedicine based on our job postings that we've looked at. It'll be interesting to see if that sticks. Uh, pharmacy technicians, medical assistants, um, physician assistants. And then I highlighted in red those that are related to um, online purchases. Industrial truck and tractor operators, stockers and order fillers, carriers, uh, logistic logisticians. Um, and then in, in black, you could see um, some of the other, um, here's software developers and uh, information security analysts uh, were in demand over this previous one year period uh, during COVID. Um, and now flipping over to job postings. Uh, so in Jobs EQ, we spider um, thousands of sites on a daily basis. We deduplicate it and then we provide that information so that you can query it and look at um, job posts in many different ways. And here I went back one year uh, to give you a sense of going back to May, um, what it looked like. The blue is showing you this year and the gray is showing you last year. So clearly the one thing that jumps out here is that last year, remember when we went into COVID, everything was locked down. People were not um, posting their job ads. That's because they weren't hiring. Um, so job postings are a precursor or, or a leading indicator of employment growth. Uh, huge drop off, very encouraging to see uh, the growth that we're seeing now. A little bit of a downturn here, probably due to seasonality uh, rather than a, a drop off of, of hiring. 
Now here, um, I changed um, the sequence to just looking at the last 30 days rather than the last year. So at the top in blue, again, uh, you're seeing this year comparing to last year, you're seeing some of the seasonality um, here, but for the most part, encouraged to see that job posts are up so much more than they were last year uh, this time. And here are the, there are tw 291,000 job openings um, across 903 occupations. Here you can see the number of uh, total ads for the top 10 and their average wage. About 15% or so of the job ads indicate their wage, and so we'll identify them here. So retail still high, stockers and order fillers still looking at that um, people buying online, and then also people going out and starting to spend, so retailers having to restock. And still we're seeing some um, healthcare related with registered nurses here um, toward the top. Um, where are they uh, hiring? Uh, the, the largest MSAs, not surprising, have most of the ads right now over the last 30 days, and you can see some of the others here. And who is hiring? Not surprising, again, we're seeing um, hospitals, Mercy Health, university hospitals, but we're also seeing um, retail and uh, uh, fast food. McDonald's is up there, Bob Evans, AutoZone. Uh, get your hair cut at Great Clips, Lowe's, um, Auto Parts, and then J.P. Morgan here um, at the bottom of the top 10 with nearly 1,500 ads in Ohio. Um, what sort of certifications and hard skills are needed? So for those on here, I know a couple of you are with workforce and with education. Uh, it looks like uh, healthcare certainly is evident in terms of the type of uh, certifications needed. When we look at hard skills, um, Office Excel, but again, ability to lift um, clearly is partially because of the warehouses that we're seeing that have some demand, and then uh, retail sales uh, and cash handling. You're seeing the uh, retail establishments starting to open. And then also, um, we take a look at the soft skills that are needed. Um, and here I'm showing you the top 25 and how many times that they are listed in different Occupa uh, um, job posts. Um, and early on during the pandemic, we were wondering if problem solving and team playing and some other things were more prevalent than they were in the past. And based on the analysis that we did, we, we couldn't find uh, a lot of support for that or um, anyways, uh, definitive support. Um, it's interesting to see how temperature takers have cropped up and across many different occupations such as security guards, um, and uh, you would expect it maybe in a waiting room or a doctor's office, um, but now we're seeing um, needing the skill of being able to take temperature um, across a broad range of occupations. When we look at the degree required, about 82,000 job posts require only a high school degree or equivalent, and uh, not all jobs identify a uh, degree requirement, um, but here you see some that have and their average wage, um, retail, those stockers, customer service, uh, nursing assistants, uh, laborers, and production workers um, in the top 10 in Ohio. And then 52,000 that require a, um, an associate's degree or higher and nurses at the top. Uh, you can see medical uh, showing up here, um, but also interesting that software um, developers was here, as well as computer user support specialists and network and computer administrators. And these jobs um, paying very well, software developers, 103,000. So clearly uh, the programs that um, your state has implemented to try to um, get more people to have those skills is important and is needed uh, during the current environment. Those jobs are in demand. So um, in summarizing then, uh, before we see if there are any questions, is the crisis is coming to an end. Um, this is great to see the percentage of people, the number of people that are getting their vaccine in terms of the economic outlook in the US. Uh, from a GDP perspective, sharp and short, we're on, um, we're on track to recover the GDP loss during this uh, recession. Employment though, is going to be varying greatly by industry and it depends on us getting to herd immunity before we get back to a more normal um, economy. And 
clearly um, it's going to be depending on people feeling safe um, before they get out and spend. In, in the short term, Ohio was more resilient during the COVID recession, but long term, the industry mix um, geared with a higher percentage of manufacturing is geared towards slower um, employment growth. But again, based on what we've seen in terms of the economic development success you've had over the past two years and the move of some country, some companies bringing more supply chain back into the US, um, I believe is going to predict that, show that forecast uh, to be more negative or um, not as positive as, as it should have been. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions if you have some. For those of you, I know we're close to our one hour. If you need to jump off, then um, thank you again for attending and please be safe, get your vaccine if, if um, you feel that um, it makes sense to do that and um, please go out and spend um, in, a, in a safe environment. So with that, um, Avery, do we have any questions? Let me check my email to see. Okay, I'll just take a look here, a not having heard from Avery here. Um, Dennis West says, we are seeing some manufacturing companies in our area who have acquired additional contracts since coming back from COVID that they have to hire additional workforce leading to several job fairs to attract these much needed workers, yes. Um, and what we're hearing, um, from many areas around the nation, especially for the lower paid jobs, is that given the additional unemployment insurance that the government is paying through the early September, especially in the tourism and restaurant area, uh, it's difficult to bring some of those workers back, especially if they have kids at home that are going to school or if they're at risk and they don't feel safe um, getting back into the economy. Okay. Um, Joseph, I work in higher education in Central Ohio. Do you see the supply of graduates being well aligned with these employment demand indicators? Where might colleges and universities look to develop new programs to meet emerging employment needs? Um, that's a good question. Central Ohio. Um, so what we could do is go to JobsEQ and look and see um, how well you're, you are aligned. And I would need to do that. Um, and so Joseph, if you wanted to ask Avery to um, maybe get an account manager call call you and give you a demo and highlight your region. I'm sure that they would be happy to do that so that you can see how well you are doing. It's interesting when we look at um, BS degrees and hire and we've talked to employers, they say, you know, typically if I have to hire an engineer, I'm not really worried whether or not the nearby university is producing enough engineers because I'm going after either a statewide or a national market to um, employ that person. But if if we're, um, say, an engine plant and I need machinists or welders, then it is really important to make sure that the community college is producing those machinists and welders um, and with the uh, specific skills that are needed because often um, um, when someone graduates from a community college, they obtain their job um, in the area where they've received their degree. So um, there's a lot, it's, having alignment with the local industries in terms of graduates is a lot more important at the community college level and at the, um, you know, getting out of high school level, career technical school level as well. But good question. Okay, on here, I saw something about teleworking. On the teleworking numbers, is the percentage based on the base number of workers who can telework based on their job duties or all workers? Um, I would expect it's based on, it, it, so it's a household survey, so it's all workers. It's not just those that can telework. But Shanna, um, you can go to a blog that we wrote if you, um, if you um, put in your Google remote work Chamura, we wrote a blog on what occupations can telework and where around the country are you going to see most of the potential um, prospects of people being able to work from home. And maybe um, Avery, if you could add the blog. 
sure enough, she's on top of things. So she added the blog for you to take a look at. Um, all right. Um, there was a question about green jobs. I see that Avery answered that. Um, and I'm not seeing any further questions. And if you have any questions for Scott as well, feel feel free to post those. Okay. Avery's saying that's all the questions I've seen so far. Okay. Well, let me thank you again um, for attending this presentation. We have an office in Cleveland, and I, I love going back to Cleveland and uh, visiting there. Um, we're in Playhouse Square. If you're ever around, please drop by after after we're back at work and, and say hello to us. So thank you again. Please be safe and um, go out and spend. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>